All right, welcome along to the Arty Soccer Podcast. Raf Giallo here. I was joined a little bit earlier on by Paul Corey and Graham Gartland, where we reacted to the Euro 2024 draw, also talked about a lot of the late goals in the League of Ireland, including uh, for Shamrock Rovers, for St. Pat's and for Drada United. And also we looked ahead to the FAI Cup semi-finals, among plenty of other things, both here and also further afield. But uh, further afield is exactly where Anthony Pine is. Anthony, you're in a hotel room in Glasgow for very good reason. I am indeed, Raf. Uh, sunny Glasgow, sunny right now. But give us, give it thirty minutes, as as Billy Connolly once said. If you want the weather to change in Scotland, wait thirty minutes. It's it's very changeable over here, and I think this is, of course, the Republic of Ireland Women's World Cup playoff match against Scotland at Hampton Park tomorrow night here in Glasgow. Um, Scotland bet Austria last Thursday night in the first playoff round to set up this game, and it was pouring rain, and I think we're sort of expecting similar tomorrow night but a huge game uh, as we know potentially a historic night for this Ireland team they've been on a, a hell of a journey the last few years and now they are potentially potentially 90 minutes away from making it to the World Cup raft but as we know this is an absolute Rubik's Cube of a, of a system the playoff system Ireland could win tomorrow and still not be at the World Cup they may have to go to the Inter-Confederations playoffs in New Zealand in February um, if Switzerland and Iceland both win and that is because they are higher ranked yeah. in the playoffs and they will go directly to the World Cup so Ireland would need to win and hope that either Switzerland or Iceland slip up they're playing uh, Switzerland are playing Wales and Iceland are playing Portugal so we're, we hope one of them slip up more, more, the most important thing here is that Ireland win of course is they, they keep it in their own hands you know you would fancy them in the Inter-Confederations playoffs because they would be one of the highest ranked teams there uh, but this is going to be a difficult game, Raph, there's no doubt about it. There's not going to be much between these. And Ireland have their fair share of injuries as well. So it's going to be tough. But um, yeah. the, the, the sense is that it is doable. Yeah, we're gonna we'll 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 tease all that out, including that Rubik's cube of a, <laughs> a confounding system that they've come out come up with for this uh, second round of the playoffs, which of course means even if you win, um, especially in Ireland's case, it doesn't guarantee going directly to the World Cup. But uh, first off, obviously the game is going to be live on RT two and the RT player. It's going to be directly after Copenhagen versus Manchester City, our live coverage of the Champions League. Directly after that, from about seven forty five, we'll start coverage and kick off at Hampton Park is at eight o'clock. George Hamilton, Stephanie Roach in Glasgow with you, actually. They're going to be on commentary. And then Peter Collins is going to be joined by Karen Duggan and Lisa Fallon in studio just for the, the build-up um, halftime reaction and all of that. But um, obviously the situation and why you're in, because obviously I was talking to you in the office last week and you could have been in Glasgow or you could have been in Vienna, but Abby Harrison's goal at Hampden Park last Thursday uh, in extra time gave Scotland the victory over Austria. And that's exactly why... Ireland have them so the way it was being built up over the last while was and especially because Austria did so well at the European Championships gave England a good game uh, also gave Germany a good game in the uh, in the last eight that Austria was the team one would have wanted to avoid but Scotland obviously have major tournament experience so they're going to be dangerous as well yeah I mean look the, the margins are, are pretty small Austria the best ranked team they're 20th in the world but Scotland are 23rd and Ireland are 26th, I think. So, you know, you're not talking a huge difference between any of these teams. The sense probably before the playoff on Thursday was that Austria are just the better round of team. Very well organised. Very Paul spoke a lot about them in the build-up. Um, well drilled, solid, not many obvious weaknesses within the side. But Scotland, and Paul did say this actually afterwards, uh, after Thursday, they, they, they kind of took some people, probably the Austrians themselves, by surprise. They, they played very well. They were... They were physical. They play on the front foot. They're direct. They've got very strong individuals within that, the likes of Kim Little and uh, Carlin Weir. So they're, they're not they're not unlike Ireland in that Ireland would be a solid, organised outfit. And within that, they would have a couple of standout individuals. In Ireland's case, that would be Katie McCabe and Denise O'Sullivan. Uh, that game on Thursday was was settled up by a set piece. It was, it was a header, you know, in extra time. Don't be surprised if it's a similar scenario tomorrow night because they could just cancel each other out. Um, but they are. They're, uh, it's gotten a dogged, capable team. There's players, as you say, that they have big tournament experience. Now, they they, um, they missed out on the Euros, the last Euros, um, and they were very unlucky not to get out of the group stages of the, the 2019 World Cup. Um, so it's there's definitely quality and ability within that group. 
And this this will be it's it's Vera Powell said herself that they need to play the game of their lives. This is a huge ask for Ireland, and it's going to be interesting how they approach the game because it's not like they're going to say Sweden last April. Sweden are, are ranked number two in the world, and we're so clearly better than Ireland. So in a way that it simplifies the game plan. You know, they let Sweden have the ball, a, a solid deep defensive block, and then hope to just to get a break and uh, nick a goal on the break, which is what happened. And they ended up getting out there with a one-all draw. Now Ireland should probably be, they should probably back themselves a little more than that tomorrow night. You know that the difference in quality is 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 marginal, but it's going to be interesting to see how they do that because I, I felt against Finland in the second last group stage game in Tala, like certainly in the first half, Ireland ceded possession to the Finns and it it very nearly backfired. Like Finland could have been two or three and up in that game, going in at half time. They weren't. Ireland reset at the break and they came out and they nicked the goal and they went on to win the match. But if Ireland, there was not a huge amount of goals in Ireland, Raf, like if you take out the two Georgie games in the group stages, they, there's not a massive amount of goals and they don't have a natural goal scorer. Uh, they do rely on the likes of McCabe and O'Sullivan to, to pull a rabbit out of the hat creatively. So if Ireland are in a position where they're training by a goal or 2 nil, like you would fear for them. I have to say you would fear for them. They're much more comfortable protecting a lead than chasing it. So I expect a cagey game. And I, I do think it will be, it could go the distance tomorrow night. We could get extra time, could get penalties. It, it will be decided on the night. So uh, I think we strap ourselves in for uh, a tense, a tense night at Hampton Park. Yeah. And the weather, looking at it, obviously it's, uh, I can just see behind you there, obviously it looks okay at the moment, uh, at least in comparison to Thursday night. And then looking at the, uh, the forecast for tomorrow night it looks like it's going to be like tuesday is supposed to be okay so that that element's probably going to be taken out of it albeit i think both countries are pretty much used to the rain so that shouldn't <laughs> that shouldn't be an issue anyway yeah. but um just looking at the way scotland attacked austria and where their the majority of their chances came from it seemed to be they attacked down the wings and you would mm. think the ireland setup especially with the back tree and wing backs is actually ideally set up to deal with that. And also the center halves that Ireland have available. Yeah. I mean, you, you would, we Ireland have the personnel to personnel to, to be able to cope with that defensively. They're strong. You know, they are strong. They, they have, you know, there are not, Neil Fahey is back tomorrow night, which is a big boost. They, they are missing uh, important players. Ireland particularly, you know, they're missing Leanne Kiernan and, and Alan Malloy, Bruce and Little John, like, there's no guarantee any of them would have started, but they're at the very least they're they're really good players to bring off the bench. And in a game like this, like that, that can swing it. You know, the last 15, 20 minutes of this game when you're bringing on quality and experience, uh, it's very important. But yeah, look as you say, if you look, remember we watching that game the other night. There is a lot of that. They getting the ball wide, swing across as deep crosses into the box. The winning goal came from across into the box that was was well headed home. Headed home. Um, but. You, you would expect Ireland to be prepared for that. They will probably set up as they have done. They'll almost certainly set up in, in that sort of three, uh, sort of three, five, one, one uh, shape that Fair Power likes and nullify that threat out wide. And and if, if Scotland starts swinging crosses into the box, Ireland should be fine with that. Like that's really where they, they should be comfortable. When you think of like the likes of Fahey and uh, Louise Quinn and, and Courtney Brosnan, who's, who's really grown into this campaign. She looks like a very solid and confident goalkeeper now. That's okay. I think if, if that's the scenario where they are trying to, to catch her on out like that, I think we would be more comfortable as opposed to a more technical team like, say, Austria, who would try and move you around a bit and play between the lines. And, and Finland, as I said, I go back to that Finland game where they, they in the first 20 minutes, they, they really caused Ireland lots of problems in that match before they sort of fizzled out themselves. Uh, and then it's, you know, with, with some of the players that Ireland do have, because we've been talking a lot about the players that they're missing, they, they still, they have their two best players, O'Sullivan and McCabe, and they they don't need much to make something happen. You know, they don't need many opportunities to make something happen. So a little breakaway or or a dead ball ourselves, we are good on set pieces going forward as well. Um, that's what you'd hope for. But I, I really think... I. The weather is, is not particularly reliable here, as, as would be the case in Ireland. You know, we don't know. I mean, hopefully it's it's not a bad night for our sakes in the stands. Um, but it, it could still be heavy going. You know, it's, it's a big pitch at Hampton Park. Um, 
again, Ireland, uh, Scotland came through extra time the other night where it was heavy going. There was a lot of rain and, and you'd hope maybe a bit of fatigue in their le legs. Like as the game goes on, potentially that might be a factor. Uh, but we don't know. Look at this. You know, if you can, you can read too much into things like that as well, going into a game of this, because the importance of it and the adrenaline usually gets teams through. And uh, Vera Powell made the point that they haven't had to leave their base the last few days. They played the game. They've sat here. You know, they know the pitch now. They played a few games at Hampton. So they have that to their advantage as well. So uh, there, there's plenty of variables. But I, I mean, look, I, I think we can just safely assume that this is, this is going to be cagey and tight. You know, these are two evenly matched teams. Yeah, and you're going to be heading on to the press conferences of both teams later today. But from what has been spoken about already, there's a sense from the Irish point of view that fear isn't going to be a factor. And that's something that they've many of the players have stated. I mean, uh, Vera Pau has, you know, since the start of the campaign, she's talked about her team being sort of Tigers. And that's the image they're projecting, at least uh, from what they're, what they're saying prior to this, uh, what is the biggest game in Irish women's football history. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, you know, again, like the, the the Finland game was a huge game for Ireland because that was the one, like that was that was really important to get over that match just to completely box off second spot, which they did with, by winning the game. Then they subsequently booked their place to round two of the playoffs when they won in Slovakia. And before that match, it was that was all the similar talk from the players, the management. You know, they, they're not fearing it. It's, it's they're embracing the pressure. But Ireland were very nervous in in the first half of that match. They were nervous. They you know they didn't play well. So of course you know they they have to say these things. You know within them they they, they have to project confidence outwardly and and it's important for the group. But ultimately, once you step out, you know once you, you hear the the national anthems and you look around, this is a big old stadium, famous venue um it will be interesting to see how many people how many fans come to the match tomorrow night because Celtic are also playing in the Champions League um in, in Glasgow against Leipzig I think tomorrow night uh so but there should still be a healthy crowd there and once that kicks in really then you know the reality and, and the magnitude of the game can hit players so we'll only know you know we'll only know once the game gets going I, I hope Ireland will have learned something from that Finland game. And to be fair, like, you know, they, they do have a bank of experience behind them. They've proven, okay, they had difficult moments against Finland, but they they, they won the match. You know, they came through it. Ultimately, uh, they've gone to, you know, Sweden and, and nicked a draw and, and came under intense pressure. They won over in Helsinki against Finland. So they've proven to themselves that they can go on the road and get big results. And of course, tomorrow it, it wouldn't, it doesn't get any bigger than this. I mean, this is, this is the biggest game this is the biggest game that they will have played for their country because uh, it's it, it's potentially an enormous breakthrough, uh, you know, a historic breakthrough. And please God, you know, this time Wednesday morning, Raf, if we're chatting back in the office or wherever, it, it will be will be toast on Ireland making it to a World Cup, and that would just be huge. You know, on so many levels, and and they know that as well. You see, the, the players are very aware of that they're very aware of the responsibility they have, you know, playing for Ireland and, and what it means. They could see that every time they play a talent and the fans who turn up. And, um, so yeah, look, I, I just hope it doesn't weigh too heavily on them because, as I said, like it, it, a bad start and you give up a goal or two here, that that could be that. You know, Scotland are dog enough, dogged enough to just see that out. Yeah, and as you as you mentioned, obviously there's a, another two other playoffs taking place on on Tuesday. So Switzerland taking on Wales and Portugal taking on Iceland. And when you look at the uh, the World Cup ranking in brackets, you did a good a really good piece on the uh, on the RT website, setting out exactly what will happen. Because of course, as you alluded to, even if Ireland win, if Switzerland and Iceland were also to win their their games, Ireland will have to go through the the convoluted playoff. Uh, a future another playoff against in an inter inter confederation playoff basically against teams from other from other continents and the way it's ranked at the moment Switzerland of nineteen points Iceland of eighteen Ireland are on seventeen then you have Scotland and Portugal on sixteen and Wales on fourteen so ideally really doing the maths Ireland to win but also you're hoping either Portugal or Wales come out on top. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. I mean, that's as clear as you can put it, Raf. Um, we've it's been a long winding road to, to get to this point. You know, but up to now it's been a lot muddier than it currently is. But that that's basically it. Ireland, Ireland, you know, as I said earlier, first and foremost is the priority is to win. But by the time they kick off, the other two matches will have been done. Will, will be over. 
So they'll know exactly what's required. In other words, if Iceland or Switzerland fail to, to win, and I think you'd be Portugal beating Iceland would be the more likely of the two results there. Um, then Ireland will know that if they win, they're going straight to the World Cup. Uh, if the other two teams win and come to, and that and if they win after extra time, you know it doesn't have to be doing it within ninety minutes. If they win after extra time, that will count as three points, and therefore the, Ireland won't be able to catch them. And um, then they'll know that they'll be at best heading to the Inter Confederations playoffs in New Zealand. But they would be going there as one of the highest ranked teams and they'd, they would go there with a lot of confidence. You know, it's another twist in the road to get there. But if Ireland gets to that Inter-Confederations playoffs, if they get to that point, you know, it's frustrating because you go through a whole campaign and playoff games and you're still not there. But their chances of getting to, to the World Cup on Australia and New Zealand will be really good, really good. I mean, they would be going there as one of the best teams there. Um, so look, the priority is, is, is clearly just to win and then we'll see where where it leaves us but uh it, it is it's it's such a silly convoluted system raf i have no doubt they'll change this i, I just can't see well, you know, there's, there's, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of murmurings about it you know but um look it is it is what it is yeah it is what it is but fingers crossed for for the irish team that a they, they beat Scotland, but also B, some of the other results uh, work out for them as well. Uh, before I let you go, obviously, uh, there's uh, there's fixtures in the Women's National League this Saturday, once all this is over, of course, as well. And it's a very exciting season. There are three points separate in the top four, and none of the top four are playing each other in the next round of fixtures, which is going to be DLR Waves against second place Shelburne, reigning champions. Wexford, the leaders, up against uh, Sligo Rovers. Cork City taking on P Mount, who are one of those two teams that are three points off the top. Treaty United against Athlone, another team having a brilliant season in a cup final against Shelburne in a few weeks, and also three points off the top. And then Bowes against Galway. But, uh, that aside, and we, we, obviously that bridge will be crossed after the after the playoff match. But uh, Shamrock Rovers obviously joining the uh, the division next season, and also appointing Collie O'Neill, the former UCD manager. So it, what it does point to, obviously, there's a real growth of the game domestically here as well, and also what Lisa Fallon said at the start of the season that more men's SSE or Tristy League clubs need to be involved in the women's games, and we're starting to see a little bit of that now. Yeah, I mean, look, this 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 points to the white the bigger picture in terms of Ireland's World Cup qualification. Like, there is a bit of a moment here. There's something happening. There's positive momentum. I think the the short term uh, target for the women's national league would be semi professionalism, which we're I think we're inching towards that. So clubs need to be semi professional. Uh, Shamrock Rovers joining that division is great. That's a great boost for for everyone. Athlone Town doing so well is brilliant. Because it gives another dimension to the league, like you named that the the other three uh, P Mounts, Shells, Wexford. I mean, they're they're established as the top three women's teams in the country for for the last number of years. Athlon have surprised everybody this season. They've been absolutely brilliant, and and they've really made that title race even more interesting by by getting themselves in the mix and then getting to a cup final. Um, and I know as you mentioned, Collie O'Neill, like a, a such a well regarded top coach um who's been out of the game out of the league of ireland anyway for the last couple of years and it's great to see him get back and involved in it so as i said like there's the sense that we're we're in a we're in a moment now you know there's 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 something happening here and uh, it it is all connected like the, the ireland women's team the, the, any national team is is the embodiment of the game yeah, and for them to have success like for you, you would hope that there's a real knock on effect and there should be and there will be you know and they're already we can see it happening already. Like it is, it is happening already. But like, if Ireland make it to a World Cup, everybody will feel the benefit of that. Like the ramifications and the impact of that. We, I don't think we actually can understand how big it will be right now because we've never experienced it. Um, but this, this really could be. You know, this is a generational thing. And again, like I, I hope it doesn't weigh too heavily on the players because I think they are all very aware that they understand the responsibility that they have. And any, you only have to go to Talaraf any of the home games to see the crowd you know they're it's it's young girls and boys families you know it's always a great atmosphere and the, the relationship between the Ireland players and those supporters is 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 special there's a genuine bond there it's you know it's great um and as I said this is uh this is now something that it's an opportunity it's a massive opportunity for Ireland to get to a World Cup and for the the positive things that are happening in the domestic game to snowball and and to keep going 
in the right direction um, at a greater pace. Uh, so we, we will see a very interesting few weeks coming up, Raf. Yeah, for sure. And they've already had an impact with the inspiration for the you know the younger fans and also the next generation. And that's actually a perfect point to uh point to Graham Gartland and his he brought his niece to go and meet the the squad before they went over to Scotland and you know that's exactly the same thing. It's the it's the inspiration for the next generation. So Anthony, thanks a mil for coming on, and we're just going to jump to a point where Graham Gartland discusses that very point. Um, my niece. my niece Hannah, um, we she's a big football fan. Uh, she's actually a Saint Pat's fan, would you believe? Because her father uh, played for Saint Saint Pat's in the nineties, and she plays for Bally Euster. And um, a friend of mine through um, Barry McCarthy, who works for Sky. Uh, Asked, all right, I asked them, could we go out? And we went out to watch them train. And then the environment and the, the atmosphere around the group was fantastic. And I'll tell you, there was a team that came to meet them and another girl, um, and the girl was in a wheelchair. And the, the group of uh, players couldn't have been better towards them. They were fantastic. It was it, it just brought it all back about what, what sport can give to people. And and my niece was was a recipient of that. She, she brought out her Kate McCabe jersey. Katie gave her a big hug. My niece had done a project on her in school, how she was our inspiration. And she made sure she told her as well, which I was really proud of my niece to be able to have that conversation with Katie and uh, Megan Campbell, who it turned out Megan Campbell used to do ball girl when, when we played at Trotted. And she came over and was chatting as well and telling my niece that she used to watch myself play. And that was a, a, a bit of a surreal moment because my niece probably thought I was this old, old guy that, um, just the odd bit of chatting on, on a podcast or something so it was um, but it was just a, a great day all around and like I said to you you couldn't meet a, a, a better group of players to represent the country it was fantastic and it was a really enjoyable experience and as somebody who's probably been around sport looking in on it um, it was brilliant to see what, what football and women's football in this country can do yeah, we saw it with the, the European Championships in the summer. We've seen it with the success of the Irish team getting as far as a World Cup playoff and then best of luck to them on Tuesday as well. Hopefully they 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 do make it directly or if it's through the convoluted route of the, the extra uh, round of the, the playoff. But it is, as you said, with your own niece there, it is inspiring the next generation. Oh, 100%. And and we they touched on it, that what it does for them and what they see. And it's it's that representation that you look at, Raph, is that they can, like we were speaking to Megan Campbell about it. And she says there's a career in the game now where they never thought that was possible 10 years ago, where they can actually be paid to play football. And she's over based in the UK. But again, my niece is like, I'm going to, I want to play for Ireland. I want to represent my country. And, and the girls are telling her, Telling her you'll be out here soon, and you'll be you'll be doing what we're doing, and you can do it. And she she walked away hundred percent believing she could. And it, it like you said, it's looking up and seeing somebody who's very similar to yourself doing something that you want to do gives you that hope and belief that you can eventually do it one day. Yeah. So best of luck to them on Tuesday, and obviously the game is going to be live on RT two and the RT player. Uh, the draw for your 2024's qualifiers was also live on RT two and RT player yesterday, and I've seen a lot of hyperbolic terms uh, <laughs> on different articles mm. and in the across uh, across the media. But uh, yeah, nightmare is one of the ones that have been thrown, Paul. And before we listen to Stephen Kenny's reaction from Frankfurt yesterday, uh, Paul, just in regards to your initial reaction to it, I mean, it's as tough a draw as we could have got. Yeah, we were very very unlucky, I guess, with with the draw. And I guess naturally enough, when you when you look at it, we probably knew that there was going to be a difficult side coming out of pot one. Um, Netherlands was probably one of the more difficult teams within that pot, and then certainly within pot two, the two teams that you want to avoid were France and England. Desperately unlucky to draw France. Um, and even when you got into pot four, like Greece and Turkey were probably the two teams they didn't want to get. We've, we've pulled them out as well. So, I mean, it's it's been. Probably the narrative around Stephen's tenure since he's been put in charge is that he's kind of been hit with with desperate um, amounts of, I mean, a, a lack of luck, really. And uh, this certainly lends itself to that narrative. And it's going to be very, very difficult. I mean, even if we've been drawn a, an easier group, but I was still probably a little bit more on the pessimistic side. I, I think it's still very early for this side. I think we're still relying on the development of these players playing at a higher level and then bringing that through to the national side. But we certainly could have been dealt a, a more favourable hand. And it's going to be very, very difficult for us, Raf. It's it's probably highly, highly unlikely that we're, we're going to qualify for 
the this tournament. But I guess from a fan's point of view, it's probably one where you, we all need to maybe sit back and actually enjoy what's about to come. Uh, you know, we're going to be welcome some of the, the world's best talent in that group, even Haaland coming to the Aviva for, for the Norway game. Over the next 18 months, we're going to be absolutely spoiled with the, with the teams and the games that we're going to be playing. And we're just, I guess, fingers crossed that we do as well as we possibly can. We obviously love that we take maximum points against Greece and Gibraltar, and then somewhere along the way, maybe nick a result against France and Netherlands. But there's certainly some great cities involved there for the away fans, um, whether it's Rotterdam or Amsterdam, Athens, Paris or Lyon, or wherever the game's going to be held, depending on the Rugby World Cup. It's a great group to look forward to. Yeah, and we're just going to listen to Stephen Kenny now, who was speaking to RT Sport in Frankfurt directly after the draw. As tough as draws we could have got, um, but you know we're looking forward to big games in, in Dublin next year. You know, with Holland, France, Greece. You know, and you know coming to uh, coming to the Aviva. I think that uh, we've shown the capacity in the last year to get results against some big nations like. Well, he's putting a brave face on it and he has to. There's no, there's no choice there, Graham. But uh, what he does say at the end there, and if you look through, OK, in his reign, we haven't played too many of the top nations just with the, na- with the nature of the Nations League. Portugal in a competitive game is probably the biggest that we have faced during his, his time in charge. But generally, it seems that Ireland under him and even under previous regimes, sometimes we do raise our games again or raise our game against the you know the, the top teams and generally it's the teams below that that we and or at our level that we tend to struggle at or struggle with a little yeah, bit yeah 100 percent. we touched on this talking about it at the weekend about we tend to punch above our weight against the the teams above us and, and we put in plucky performances some of them are um sort of moral victories where you lose even though we do well over in Portugal I think we lose the game in the last couple of minutes with two two Ronaldo goals and you lose 2-1 but the performance is brave and it's seen as being in the right um, vein that's how you lose a game we're, we're, we're trying to play football we're playing against a top team and we're competing with them again similar to going away to Scotland we do really well over in Hamden the game is a really good game to watch it's enthralling we're in the game we're playing a good brand of football we're mixing the game up and look dangerous on the counter-attack as well and then we come home and the performance against Armenia isn't great and then it becomes an argument between well what do you want performances or results and and it's okay to want both it's okay to want a good performance and a good result to, on top of that especially against the teams that you should um, be beating but like to have a to, like to go and play France and, and put in a good performance, you, you, you're probably more likely got, not going to take Ant now that game. It's a tough one where you have to look at putting in good performances against Greece and trying to take victories and then hoping that you can take something off Holland and France at home in the, in their in your home fixtures. But it's such a big ask. Like Holland, Holland are a fantastic group. It, I think um, it's been reported this morning that Van Gaal's going to take back over from uh, uh, Koeman's going to take back over from Van Gaal after the, the World Cup So, um, and he done a great job with them France, I think Mbappe his performance in the last France game was unbelievable he was nearly unplayable, he was fantastic and how you think, right, how do we stop him but they've so much other talent in the team and defensively they're so strong as well so um, I, I could see us putting in good performances against them, but maybe not taking results. But then it becomes about how we how we perform and what results we get against Greece and Gibraltar. But I do think qualification from the group is beyond us because we haven't shown enough in the last two years to show that we can get results, A, when we're playing well and, and get results um, against the teams around us neither. So... We could put in a good performance against France and still lose the game. We could put in a good performance against Holland and still lose the game. But then we couldn't play well against France. We mightn't play well against Greece and and not get out now that game neither. So it's it's a diff- It's such a difficult group. And like we said, we haven't shown previously that we can put a consistent run together over a, a period of a group that will give us a chance to come out of it. Yeah, like we don't know exactly what state the Dutch and the French are going to be by the time the campaign starts. But uh, even like obviously, as you said, um, Ronald Koeman's taking over from Van Hal after the World Cup. He did really well with them previously, and I think they were just kind of unlucky. The Barcelona job came up before um, before the last European Championships, but then Frank de Boer took charge. Didn't quite work for them. The French 
Um, again, you know, they they have their issues within their camp, but like the quality of players they have, I mean, if say if Mbappe is not available, you know, there's 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 about three or four players right behind him there that you know we if if they had an Irish passport, we'd be crying out for. So that is uh, that's the issue we have. And uh, Paul, just in the vein of what Graham said there really the what we're looking for here um and this is even before talking about playoffs and how the nations league affects that what we're looking for really is to see what our performances are like against the likes of greece and gibraltar i'd imagine well that is i mean black and white about it raf is that's what seems going to be measured on within this campaign i don't think many people are going to be looking at the the france games and netherlands games as i mean chances where we're gonna we're gonna realistically take points off either one of those sides or where we should be going in expecting to take points off either one of those teams. And um, Stephen's tenure within this group is most certainly going to be defined over those four games. They're almost like cup finals now, the, the games against Gibraltar and Greece. And like Garth's mentioned, we haven't exactly been consistent within those games, particularly over the last, um, the, the World Cup qualifiers and the previous Nations League campaign. I mean, there was probably... Uh, a narrative around those games whereby we, we probably gave Stephen a bit of leeway with regards to blooding in new players and the fact that we were bringing young players who maybe weren't as experienced within managing games or or seeing out games and that bit of leeway is, is probably not going to be there within those fixtures uh, we're certainly going to have to to step up and if you look to the group and the way the fixtures have actually been dealt out we played Greece away within the second game and then we played Gibraltar at home and that takes place over the same campaign within June of next year so that is going to be huge like we play France at home initially Greece Gibraltar we need to have six from nine uh, after those three fixtures or else the pressure will will certainly mount on Stephen but we have shown we, we've put in really good performances at times we just need to see that a bit more consistently but the other point you made there, Raf, is, you know, the Nations League is very new to us all. And we're probably only now seeing the importance of that when it comes to these qualifying campaigns. Like, even if you look at Scotland, they came in in, in, in pot two and they've been dealt, yes, a difficult group, but nowhere near as difficult as, as we have. And when it comes around to the Nations League next time around, yes, it has to be viewed as, as a possible route into a playoff. But when it comes to the seeding of these draws, it's absolutely massive. And we need to improve our performances in that competition. Yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, as you said, the fixtures, I think there was uh, an issue yesterday um, where there was a suggestion that UEFA were going to send out a new fixture list. But actually, as it turns out this morning, as confirmed, staying the same, France first uh, in uh, at the Aviva Stadium. And then uh, in Ju- next June, then we go to Greece and or we go to Greece and then Gibraltar uh, come here and then we play France away in Paris then in September, um, followed then by the Dutch coming here. And then we finish the campaign over in either Amsterdam or Rotterdam or wherever the game is going to be held but speaking of tough groups um Shamrock Rovers obviously in the Europa Conference League are in a very challenging group and Stephen Bradley before uh before the the fixtures began did suggest that Molde were going to be the toughest team and Graham no doubt about it then what we saw um in Norway last week you know they were a step above even what Ghent provided previously in Belgium yeah they were and and also, there was actually extra pressure on Molde to perform in this game and get a result because they had, they had lost in the last minute against your gardens. So they they knew that they have to beat Rovers both home and away and then go and take on Ghent and your gardens to make sure that they come out of group as well. So you could see that there was an extra bit of purpose and zip to how um, Molde approached the game. There was a real... Um, Aggression to how they attacked in the game. They pushed their, they pushed their wing backs really, really high. Their inside rights, which was one of them was uh, Hussein, and the other one was Ericsson, disrupted Rovers' back line really, really well because they made runs on the inside of Lions and on the inside of Finn on the other side. And they just pinned Rovers back. And uh, Rovers had gone for a more defensive approach in the game. Um, and it was hard for them to get out and make contact and get the ball, but Molde. You could see Stephen Bradley's approach to the game was right. We, we won't let Atten come through the middle of us. We'll try and keep them to the wide areas. And then they gave up crosses. And Stephen touched on it as well, that he probably wasn't happy with how he defended some of the crosses. Um, and when you are going to give up crosses, there needs to be a relaxedness to how you defend them. And I, and I thought in the first 15 minutes, they were maybe a little bit hesitant um, in their defending. There was a nervousness to them. Um, but... To get in at one nil at half time, I think Stephen thought, right, we, we if we can get through the next 15 to 20 minutes here, we can maybe empty the bench with Bork, Green, uh, Bork, Gaffney, and Bourne. 
But then the goal just after half time is a killer and they're a little bit unlucky with it because it's Cav- Sean Cavanagh's coming back trying to help out and he just gets a little deflection on the ball and it takes it into Ericsson's path and that allows him just to nip by Grace. Um, he fires a fantastic shot off the crossbar, it bounces down and then the rebound. But um, And that goal effectively kills the chance that maybe Stephen was looking to, to produce then in the last 40 minutes. Um, and then again... Molda have to come to Rovers now on, on Thursday and that makes for an intriguing fixture as well because how does Stephen approach that because they have obviously have dropped it away on Sunday then and if he is prioritising the league maybe he'll change the game up um, maybe he'll change his team up again because that was actually a really tough game against Shells yesterday too Shells pushed them right to the wire so every game is important for Rovers in the scheme of what they're trying to do uh, who do rest who do play and which game he prioritises but I think Stephen will feel vindicated and justified for making them changes, considering how well they finished the game yesterday against Shells. Yeah, just uh, what Graham said there, Paul. The you know the team sheet when we saw it uh, ahead of the Molda game, you know, was probably indicative of where Rovers' ambitions are in terms of the longer term goal of you know to to get back to qualify for European group stages regularly you need to do it through the league and it kind of you know the the fact that say Justin Ferzai who has been brilliant and then also Idamo and Maku were both named in the starting lineup in Norway probably just shows where which way he's leaning in terms of what's most important right now 100 percent, and I think he's right in that sense I think going away from home in European uh, games is always going to be tough irrespective of what 11 you put out I mean you only have to look at the results that they've had this campaign and even last campaign away from home versus the ones that they've had in Tala and uh, I thought it was the right decision because what you you know Graham will know this better than I will but what they are trying to build at Chamber Rovers is an environment uh, within that first team where they are maybe not consistently qualifying but consistently giving themselves a chance of getting into the group stages of those competitions and when you look at the draw that they've had um, you know, it was favourable in the sense that they went the Champions route once they got knocked out of the Champions League and the fact that they were seeded in, in some of those draws was a massive helping hand. Whereas when you flip that with the other teams who who finished in the second, third and, and fourth positions, it's a much more difficult route. You're having to play way more games and a lot of the time you're not seeded within those draws. So it made sense Um for Stephen, I'm sure he would have rather that they hadn't dropped some of the points that they had have done in the league over recent weeks and maybe that the the league was a little more put to bed, but he, he was put in a situation last Thursday whereby he had to make a call on, on what team he was going to go with, with Shelburne in mind. And Shells, just listening to Roy Gaffney's interview after the game yesterday, you know, they've proved a really difficult opposition for Stephen Bradley. So probably not too much of a surprise that he he rested maybe some of his more creative players and held them back for, for Shells um, yesterday. But it'd be interesting to see what, what team he goes with now on, on Thursday. You know, the fact that they they took points off Jew Gardens and they've gone on to win the the two games, one against Molde and one against Genk. I, I think at home, they'll probably fancy themselves a bit more. We obviously know the, the finances that are there if they are to take points. And I'd be surprised if he went with the same sort of team. I think he'll probably go with, with more of the team that played against Shells yesterday and, and look to, to take something within that game. But with regards to the decision he made last week, I think, you know, Gartz is... As rightly said, it was vindicated. You know, he he took three points against Shells. That was absolutely huge because if they drop points there, Derry are licking their lips and, and really on the heels of Shamrock Rovers. But a really good display yesterday with regards to just maybe retaining their composure, constantly working the ball, working Shells. And that will probably give them a bit of spring heading into Thursday. And uh, I would say it'd probably be more the team that you saw yesterday as opposed to the team that played more the last week. Yeah, and- it's interesting, Raf, because... Obviously, Rovers have been judged off the fact that they're competing on two fronts, which they didn't have to do last year. Rovers are on 69 points right now. If Rovers win the last three games, or the la- three of the last um, four games, they finish on the same points total that they finished on last season. The difference is this season, the two differences are Rovers are competing in the Europa Conference, which gives them a backlog of fixtures and moves their games to a fr- uh, to a Sunday. The other big difference is they actually have a team that's collecting points underneath them. Like th- That's the difference now is that Derry have actually put a, a, a title challenge together where they're, they're, we're in touch and distance of Rovers. Now, I know five points is big at this point in the season with four games to go. But last season, Rovers, by this stage, I think Rovers were, were anointed champions, you know, with three, with three or four games to go. 
So they're on course to do exactly what they done last season, Shamrock Rovers. They've got the same amount of points. They've got the same amount of defeats as they did last season. They lost five. They lost five. So the seasons are really similar. It's just the narrative around it is different because they're maybe not um, competing in Europe as well as people would like them to. But they also have a challenge with Derry as well that Stephen's making sure, as Paul says, that the champions route into your into getting into group stages in Europe gives you the most favourable chance of doing it. And he's guaranteeing that for the football club. But when you compare the two seasons, exact same points tally, exact same in terms of their defeats. So it's a very similar season. The two differences is obviously there's a group stages and uh, and Derry are coming. And that's where the the, the, the narrative around John McGrover's season has changed a little. Yeah, and obviously to get coefficient points as well, uh, winning matches in the group stages are going is going to be key and the home games are the ones that are going to be focused on. So there's some Molde left at home and then also Ghent have to come here. So when you're looking at this uh, game against Molde, obviously as we saw, they're a quality team, um, but how do Shamrock Rovers approach it this time? Um, I know we spoke previously, I think, ahead of the Ghent game about spacing. Um, they seem to get that right, at least in the centre parts of the pitch. But as you pointed out, um, in Norway there last week, down the flanks and then just how they dealt with balls into the into the box seemed to be a problem. So do they just have to, you know, does the line, defensive line have to step forward a couple, a little bit at least at home and probably naturally it will just with the nature of the fixture being there. But how do they approach it? What's the best route? Um, again, having watched the game and and, and it, it, the, it's small little differences in the game, when you when you play wing-backs against wing-backs, it tends to be who, who generally controls the ball can get the wing-backs into high and advanced positions. And they can pin your wing backs back, and that and that ten and that's what Shamrock Rovers do to teams in the domestic league. So Mold Molder done that to them, where the two wing backs, um, Linz was one of them, and Lovek was was the other one, and they were both really athletic and really strong, and they pinned row. So it's about how brave Rovers can be, but that you can only get your wing backs into into them positions if you have good possession of the football. So Rovers would look to maybe try and get. It, wrestle control of the ball at times and, and get if they have control of possession they can, can control the time of when their wing backs go high I do think the communication from the back three especially needs to be a little bit better and you're hoping that with Lopez coming back into the team that's one of his big attributes that he's willing to take midfield runners so you're willing to take midfield runners off the likes of O'Neill um, who else played in there I think it was Kavna that you're willing to say to them, I can take him, you stay here, you you help in them positions. Because sometimes the midfielders were going with the runners a little bit too much, and then they ended up a little bit too deep on top of their on top of their centre backs, and they couldn't get up and get pressure on the ball. So you, you imagine that Tallis Stadium with the crowd behind them that they're able to be a little bit more on the front foot in that, be a little bit more dangerous on the counter-attack, hold the ball up a little bit more so that allows them to get into their positions that they like. And then you need Jack Bourne and the likes of Bork on the ball. What Bork gives you in Europe is he's able to carry the ball and relieve pressure for you and get you up the pitch. And Bourne gives you that ability to then control the possession to allow your wing-backs to maybe push their wing-backs back as well. If they can do that at times, at times in the game, because you're never going to do it for the whole game. People think, oh, you're a possession-based team, you're going to control the... No, you need to be able to control the ball, you need to be able to control the opposition in defensive shape, and you need to be good on the counter-attack. All them things, you, all them three components... You, it's up to you to decide when you bring them into the game or when the opposition allows you to bring them to the game. So if they can do them in the game, they give them a chance. Um, but again, Mulder, a fantastic side. I have to say they were really, really good. Centre backs are fantastic. And they have a lot, they have Fofana who's coming back into the team, who was suspended for this game, 19-year-old striker who's who's a who's electric. So he's gonna gonna be a different proposition for them in terms of dealing with him down the middle of the pitch. Yeah, and hopefully from you know, uh, compared to what Shamrock Rovers and Shelburne had to put up with uh, yesterday, hopefully the weather is going to be far, far better. Obviously, Graham, you were uh, in the safety of the studio and the, <laughs> uh, you know, spared spared from the elements. But, uh, the first time I was delighted, I wasn't on co-comps. I was like, I'm getting, uh, and then the, I, I tell you what, the old makeup artist, the artist earned our money yesterday. So I think I, I kept her on for this morning, Raf. You had me <laughs> battered with it. Yeah, but uh, yeah, let's just uh, have a look back at the winning goal from Rory Gaffney, which was uh, in the 95th minute. It's a big corner kick, a big set piece for Shamrock Rovers in the dying embers of the match, floats it in. Well, they haven't managed to get the white Gaffney is there, and it's gone in! Oh, they've done it! Shamrock Rovers, 3-2! 
Rory Gaffney at the back post and the lead. Remarkable. Winning is a bit of a habit and it has become so as we saw there. I mean, you would have it looked like it looked like it was heading for a draw at that stage, Paul. But uh, yeah, obviously, as we as we pointed out, the weather made it and the conditions made it not too conducive to a good game of football for two teams that do want to get the ball down and play as well. But um, from the Shamrock Rovers point of view, before we touch on Shelburne, it's just a, it's another, you know, we, we talked about all the late goals they scored last season. There was a, an element of it this season. It just seems to be, it just seems to be something that runs through this team. Yeah, hundred <clears throat> percent. I mean, it was, it was one of them, wasn't it, up in Tala, where when the wind and the rain come, it's very difficult place to actually get the ball down and play football. But I thought both teams managed the situation pretty well. I mean, obviously, Rovers conceded two sloppy goals. Um, but I thought, by and large, particularly in the second half, when he made the changes, they seemed to control the game a lot better. Uh, they seemed to move the ball around and move the opposition about. And that's why, Raph, a lot of the time they score so many goals is because they work the opposition so hard. And the legs and the minds become more tired as you go deeper into the game. And that's maybe when the gaps and that's when you start to get some of the rewards for, for continuing to play the way you do. But, I mean, Rory Gaffney has, you know, without a shadow of doubt, been their player of the season this year. Um, and he'll be nailed on for that award and potentially even for, for the league uh, player of the year. He hasn't maybe notched up as many league goals as, as one might suspect. He's only got nine. But I think his, his general play, the way he holds the ball up, the way he runs the, the channels, particularly in Europe as well, he's caused a number of defences a lot of problems. And yesterday, popping up with that goal, like that, that really wasn't an easy chance. That's a hard one where it's, it's coming from a height, it's coming down. You see so many times that people take a, a swipe at it and it goes into the stands, but he's really controlled it. Um, you know, almost with his with his instep, and it's he's caught it so perfectly uh, in off the post, and it's a testament to himself. It's a testament to to Shamrock Rovers how often they've actually dug themselves out of difficult situations, and uh, probably the game that will will get them over the line when when it comes down to it. Because if they were to drop points, like I mentioned before, Derry would really be fancying themselves, considering that they still have to play each other. But uh, for Roy Gaffney, uh, a superb moment. And I'm sure, like Damien Duff, will be looking at maybe some of the goals. I was never a goalkeeper, so I don't tend to criticise keepers. But I, I thought for the first and second, they probably could have done a bit more to keep it out. But um, they're certainly heading in the direct direction. They, they caused Shamrock Rovers a few problems yesterday. Yeah, let's listen to Shelburne manager Damien Duff. Uh, There's always good value with his uh, post-match interviews this season, and this one was pretty good as well. That piece has come back to bite us again. It's been a consistent throughout the season. Uh, did we deserve to get something out of the game? Absolutely, and when it's so close to the end of the game, you're up. Um, yeah, it's definitely two points lost, which, again, a moral victory. Uh, it's another hard luck story. That's what I'm telling the guys in there. I'm sick of them, and they have to stop. But listen again, I couldn't be prouder of them. How do you bridge that gap between what could have been and what should have been? Uh, listen, I'll never change. We'll keep training, we'll keep coaching, we'll keep believing, we'll keep giving them detail week in, week out. So if there's ever hard luck stories, which there has been this year, that's all we've ever done. Uh, the lads will dust themselves down. They've been excellent at that all year. When there's a disappointment, we're back in tomorrow morning. And we'll start addressing the biggest game that Shelburne Football Club have had in over a decade. Overall, how can you reflect on the performance? Again, you haven't got a result, but you will take an awful lot from that game tonight in terms of the springboard now into to what is potentially a season-defining game next season. Absolutely. Next Listen, the performance usually gets results, but like I said to you before the game, I know you picked up, oh, you haven't won a few in the league. Um, when we're performing like that, the results will come. But equally, it, it, I can see the frustration in you that again. Oh, no, it's, listen, it's, the frustration it's, isn't it's with air, the frustration isn't with the guys. The frustration isn't with the guys. Obviously, the result, you know, four minutes added on. I think it ended up 96 and a half minutes. The game is still going on. Absolutely incredible. I don't think it's a corner. I think it's a free kick to back, back post. But listen, if I was to air my views about officials and blah blah and stuff that goes on in this league, I won't be on the touchline next week. So. I am very proud to manage Shelburne Football Club and I want to be on the touchline next week. I cannot wait. I'm looking forward to it already. That's why. All right, that is uh, Shelburne manager Damien Duff. <laughs> There's more to that interview. It doesn't just stop there, but it was a uh, that was, it was, uh, that was yeah that was that was a really nice clip. He's been he's been a great introduction to the league in terms of uh, in terms of being a manager in it as well. Um, but uh, Graham, just on his on the progression of his team, we'll talk about the FAI Cup semi final. 
a little bit later on when we when we preview the preview the two games which are going to be live on RT2 and the RT player as well um on Sunday but the progression of his team as he alluded to there I mean the results in the league in recent in recent weeks haven't been great I think it's something like now nine games without a win uh, although albeit five of them have been draws but the performances have actually been largely good in recent times yeah the the the, the probably best compliment you can give his, his team is that you wouldn't you wouldn't judge them as a team that that got promoted. You 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 forget that they're just this is the fourth season back in the Premier Division, um, and and you expect teams that are going to come up to be competitive. You have that um, winning mentality of having been promoted, and then there's a togetherness in the squad, and you expect them to be competitive when they come up. But they haven't just been competitive. They tried they've tried to play football in the right way. So full credit to him and, and all the people that are saying he wasn't going to be around as well and he wasn't going to see it through. Like, you know, Damien's not silly. Here's all these things and, and that's going to motivate me even more. Um, like you said, the performance have been very good. They've gone away to Finn Harps. They got a late equaliser against Harps in, in the in the dying embers of the game. That would have felt like a victory. The, the game again, the game Shells v Pats was a fantastic watch as well. They've been like again and the Rovers game yesterday. It's a fantastic and intriguing watch. And they've been involved in another great game. The, 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 the job they've done on, on Bowles in the quarterfinal of the Cup was another. Just They absolutely blitzed them in the first half. And Bowles couldn't live with them. Um, and they've, they've been fantastic. And they've been such a welcome um, addition back into the Premier Division. And so is, so is Damien, in fairness to him. Um, I, I I agree with him there. I think he'd be disappointed with the with how many goals they give away from set pieces, which has hindered them a lot this season. And I know Joey O'Brien would be particularly frustrated with that because it'd be something that you could see their defensive shape yesterday and the work that Joey's done on that in open play. And I think they'd be frustrated with the goals they give away, um, especially the both of them from from set pieces, one in the last minute and the goal they conceded um, after the I think. Um, clearly scores in the 30th minute as well so um, they concede in the 84th minute from Clearly's goal and, and you could see I agree with what Paul says they, they started to get a little bit tired and when they, on a, and when a, a player like Ferruja checks like that onto his left foot and you know as soon as he checks your back line needs to probably squeeze two or three yards to make sure that you can get out of the box and give your keeper enough distance that he can see if there is a header or, or it is going to come all the way through that he can get a, an eye on the ball as early as he can and they just stayed in that little two two three yards and it allows the header to come in and then clearly um, follows up and and then um, gets the goal and um, there is a little bit of contention around the last goal Green does have his arm on the back of Negru Negru looked like he was getting tired again he's only a young player um, it, it's only his third start and, and he's probably never faced the team like Rovers in terms of the intensity of the pressure in the last 10 minutes and a couple of um, just sort of concentration from from errors from him in the last 10 minutes I think Green had a couple of chances down that side he dropped the back pass short at one stage and you can see he just got a little bit tired but um, it's a wonderful finish from Gaffney like you said I think um what Paul says about him scoring nine goals, it's not just the, the nine goals he scored. He's had 10 assists this season as well, which is a fantastic um, contribution to the season from him. If if he finishes on 10 assists and not, he's contributed to nearly 19 goals this season for Shamrock Rovers, which is a fantastic and fully deserved in terms of, I think he's, I think he's nailed on to be player of the season. Yeah, uh, we'll come back to Shelburne a little bit later on because, of course, they're involved in an FAI Cup semi-final on Sunday against Waterford. But uh, in the Premier Division, in terms of results, Strade United got back to winning ways with a 1-0 win at Bohemians. 10-man Bohemians, Jordan Flores sent off with 20 minutes to go. Dale Rooney scoring a stoppage time winner. Derry City doing what they need to do, uh, beating Finn Harps 3-0 in the Northwest Derby. And then Dundalk and St. Pat's. And this was a big game in terms of who's going to finish third and fourth. St. Pat's. Or Adam O'Reilly's late stoppage time winner, um, sealing a 2-1 win over Dundalk, and then Sligo Rovers winning 2-0 at UCD. So nothing changes really in terms of the bottom two, other than a slight change in goal difference in favour of UCD, but still Finn Harps, uh, it's uh, plus seven for them in terms of goal difference uh, ahead of UCD. But let's start with Derry, Paul. Um, you know, we, we talked about Shamrock Rovers doing what they need to do against Shelburne, but Derry City themselves... They also have a big semi-final, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But 
they're doing what they they also are doing what they need to do. And actually, when you look at their form guide, they've been brilliant over the last over the last number of months. Yeah, that's six six wins on the bounce now in the league graph, and uh, maybe bar that the kind of poor run of form in May, they'd actually be a little closer to Shamrock Rovers. But I mean, when you look at the players that they brought in in the off season, when you, particularly when you look at the likes of. Uh, Michael Duffy and Patrick McElhenney like players who've been around the league for a long period of time they've got so much quality in that final third that they were always going to be a menace when it clicked and it certainly feels like over the last six to eight weeks that it has clicked in that final third and obviously Michael Duffy coming back from that broken leg has been a massive addition for them and uh, yeah you can you can really see the work that that Rory is starting to put in there that kind of forward line that they had of Kavanaugh patching Duffy I can tell they're going to cause the majority of teams a lot of problems and that was the case when they when they played Finn Harps um the other night and I mean they're always going to score goals and they seem as if they've got a decent foundation there to build on whereby they're keeping clean sheets so a team that have certainly got a, a huge amount of momentum be, behind them when it comes to this season they're they're obviously going to push Shamrock Rovers as far as they can but if they could add the FAI Cup to this season, it's certainly like a step in the right direction. And you would imagine then if they were to add maybe two or three to that squad come next year, they're, they're going to be closer again. And the squad are growing. Rory seems to be growing within his, his own experience. He seems to have found maybe the right combination within that team and his recruitment seems to be really good. So it bodes well for Derry at this moment in time. I'm sure Shamrock Rovers are looking over the shoulder thinking, you know, they're coming. It has that feel of when Dundalk were on top and Stephen Bradley was building. It kind of has that feel that there's a lot of momentum behind that side. So this weekend is obviously is going to be huge. You would expect them to go past Treaty, but if they can continue their league form between now and the end of the year, if Shamrock Rovers do drop points, they're showing over the last number of weeks that they're certainly going to be there to take advantage of that. Yeah, we'll come back to more on Derry just in regards to the Cup semi-final a little bit later on. But uh, just below them, obviously, Pats and Dundalk, there's always going to be a focus on this fixture, at least this season, because of the Stephen O'Donnell factor and the and how he kind of moved from one club to the other. But uh, this, in terms of now, again, the Cup, the cup final, uh, whoever gets there, if Derry City win, obviously, both will get into Europe. But... In terms of in terms of St. Pat's, I mean, it looked like they had uh, hit a little bit of a blip in terms of chasing Dundalk down for third place, Graham. But this is a, Adam O'Reilly's winner. That's that's a huge goal in the context of their personal battle between the two. Oh, it's massive, yeah. And even like you, they were involved in that game that they were four two down against Shells, and they have a great comeback in that to bring it back to four all. Um, I think. You see how important Forrester is, and that's probably where the frustration comes with his sending off against Derry, where it was needless. And you see how important he is coming back into this team because um, he scores an unbelievable goal as well. I think that gets overlooked for how well worked and and the fact that they scored in the last minute. The Pats goal is, it was a fantastic goal. Um, Sam Cortis does unbelievably well, nicks the ball, plays it out to Carter, Carter's pass into Ben McCormick, I think plays real wide and the overlap is fantastic it's such a good run and, and I th- I'm not sure who it is that slips him in but it's a fantastic decision to go right put the cross across the box and, and O'Donnell falling in it's just a, it's just an unbelievable goal and to be honest like even even yesterday when you see a last minute goal just the the joy it brings and you're, you see you see them running over to the Pats fans and Pats fans coming out of the toilet and Pats fans like bursting through the gate and it just and that and that's what makes the league so enjoyable and and great to watch is that you're seeing things that you don't normally see with with obviously the, the with Sky Television over in the UK where you're seeing just the rawness of people running out to enjoy a last minute goal and and how much that meant the Pats with everything that had gone on with them this season. So I was smiling watching it and I'm smiling listening, uh, recalling it as well. It was it was a really good goal. And Clancy and Jonathan Daly have done a really good job to make sure that they're competitive because they did come into the job late and there was a massive upheaval in terms of players leaving who went to Dundalk and followed Stephen O'Donnell. So um, full credit to St. Pat's. It was, it, was a, it was a really good goal, a really well-worked goal. The two goals are fantastic, but it was great scenes at the end of the game. Yeah, and four games to go, obviously, and Dundalk still have a one-point advantage in the table, also a two-goal advantage in terms of goal difference as well, but it's going to go right down to the wire, and both teams, I think, will be praying at least, uh, for well, at least the one that ends up finishing fourth will be praying for Derry City to, to get their hands on the cup to, to make sure that 
fourth place uh, goes to Europe as well. But before we turn to the first division, Paul, uh, draw the United again. We were talking about um, late goals there. Dale Rooney uh, scoring in the 94th minute. It's, uh, you know, they, they were on a run, I think, of like three defeats where they'd lost uh, lost 2-0. And, you know, they've had a solid season up to then. But it's just it just shows the job Kevin Doherty has done, that they keep plugging away, even when they go on a, you know, they might go on a little, you know, have a little blip on a little bit of a poor run. They seem to always pick themselves up eventually. Eventually, Yeah, an incredible job Kevin Doherty has done down there. And uh, if you think some of the games that they've won, I think they beat Sean McGraw, they beat Dundalk. So they've caused problems for every team within the division. So irrespective of whether or not they'd beaten Bowes the other night, um, you know, the fact that they're safe, at this stage of the season and probably have been for a number of weeks is a testament to the job they've done when you, when you take into consideration the resources that they would have uh, compared to some of the other teams within that division. So uh, a superb job that he has done there. And the fact that the team have, have kind of popped up with a last minute winner is, is kind of a testament to the character that they have within there for Bowes, It's, it's, it's not good. I mean, they've, they've lost far too many games within this season and, uh, that was probably another example of conceding late. I've lost track of the amount of points that they've they've lost within kind of that last 10, 15 minutes of games and being able to see games out and gather points has, has proved a, a really difficult challenge for them. And, um, you know, it, it it's not great at both this moment in time that the recruitment of the manager, some of the, the stories you'd hear is that the, the process hasn't been as efficient as, as you might suspect. And a lot has been done well off the pitch. So you probably would have thought that the, the recruitment of that new manager maybe might have been a little bit slicker process. And uh, it's a it's an important appointment, Raf, because the last number of weeks have probably shown that the bodies that they've brought in haven't really worked out for, for one reason or another. And if they are to kind of get back to where they were over the last number of seasons, recruitment is going to be a really important part of, of that process. Now, um, even even with that, Paul, and you're 100%, but next year they're, they're, they're looking at training in the mornings. Yeah, the, the new ground is coming as well, so this manager could be in, in place to take them full time, take them into a new stadium. So the recruitment for it is massive in terms of who they bring in as manager. So yeah. therefore, would you not would you not expect the process to be a little bit mm. more professional in mm. that sense to make sure like the, the approach Alan Reynolds and Derry keeping a hold of Alan Reynolds shows you what Derry are trying to do, but like you said, with everything that's coming for them, would you not expect the process around who they're going to put in charge for this? next three years to be like slick would be a great word, but even just more professional. Yeah. 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 And you can, you can sense frustration from both fans. They obviously haven't been happy with the performances on, on the pitch, but I think what they need now is a bit of clarity and you know, yourself guards and Raph, like recruitment is such a huge part of football. Like it's absolutely massive. It is, yeah. The Shamrock Rovers team, the Stephen Bradley has, don't get me wrong. They've better resources to work with. But the recruitment has been really strong. And even at Derry, the recruitment has been really strong. Look at St. Pat's. I can't imagine their budget is all that different to Bose. And Tim Clancy has got his recruitment right. So it's it's so important that, um, you know, the people off the pitch are working with the manager on the pitch at this time of year to identify the players that are going to get them back to where they were. And that process of, of recruiting the manager, you would like to see take a bit of momentum over the last number of weeks. I think even Ryan pulled out of it yesterday because he wasn't happy with how it was being run. Just doesn't bode well. And uh, the results haven't been great on the pitch, being knocked out by shells so convincingly within the FA Cup with a hearse. And uh, it's important between now and the end of the season that they get things right while looking to build to, to next season. Yeah, and just for anybody interested in just uh, the first part of the season for Bowes in terms of there was a really good interview with Keith Long, um, their former manager, uh, who was in charge, obviously, of the first uh, part of the season. Uh, he was on Johnny Ward and Dan McDonald's podcast, I think it was last week. Um, yeah. had a good listen you to that. You allowed to plug other podcasts like that, Ralph? What's the well, well John, Johnny, Johnny Ward does report, uh, match reports for us, so I think that might be... <laughs> that might I, was be with, I was with him on Saturday, absolutely on the ticket. Yeah, yeah, but it, it was it was it was, a, it was a really good interview. Um, just, so uh, anybody who does want to check that out, having listened to this, um, and all our yeah. previous episodes, <laughs> yeah, <Raph. laughs> have a listen to the RDE podcast first. Yeah, have a listen to that first, and then have a listen to that. But definitely well worth a listen. Uh, he's a very interesting uh, character. Just yeah, like, it was, life, and, life, and even the stat. Pitch. I think the stat Paul said about if if the games had finished at the seventieth minute, Bowes would have been near top of the league halfway through the season, and they just couldn't see out games. Yeah, and, and I know Paul touched on it there. Yeah, I'm looking for a petition for that soon, Raf. Or for guards. Oh, well, I know. <laughs> Seventy-five minute games. 
<laughs> so before you win the games, yeah. 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 But anyway, we'd still be playing. Yeah. In the first division, uh, Longford Town beat Cove Ramblers 4 2. Cork City promoted now uh, after a 0 0 draw at Wexford. Galway United's form continuing to, to dip a 2 1 defeat at home to Athlone and then Waterford maintaining momentum ahead of their semi final against Shelburne with a 3 0 win over Treaty United. So Cork City, as we said, promoted. We're going to be seeing them in the Premier Division next season. Waterford have gone ahead of Galway now in the table and Longford and Treaty still in occupying the rest of the playoff places. And at loan, their good form now has taken them seven points clear of uh, Cove Ramblers uh, in that sort of race not to finish bottom. And they're now within six of Bray. We're just going to listen to Colin Healy, first Cork City manager, speaking to RT Sport after that draw against Wexford. We're, we're delighted. Um, as I said, the players have been fantastic. Um, uh, they've been fantastic all season, and we're delighted, you know, for the people of Cork, you know, to be back in the Premier League. And it's um, it's been a tough two years, um, but we're we're back uh, in the Premier League, and um, and delighted for everybody. Did you think the way you got up was the way it was going to happen tonight? Um, no, I listen. I listen. It was always going to be a tough game. I said, uh, um, for Galway, I know Athlone, but um, they're they're in a, in a good uh, run of form. Um, we knew down here at Wexford. Listen, they're a very very good side. They're a good football team, and we knew that it would be a difficult game. But I thought the lads stuck to the game plan um, very very well. Um, we had a lot of chances, but um, I suppose at the end, you know, when the results came through, that we just probably had to see out the game. Obviously, it's huge for the club, but huge for the city as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's the city, and as I said, it's a, we've had success over for for. for for um, in the last few years, um, winning leagues and winning FA Cups, and you know we we got relegated, and it wasn't nice, and it and it hurt us, and it hurt me it hurt myself because I was in charge um, uh, towards the last three or four games of the season. It wasn't my team, but had a lot of young players from the academy in it, and when we went down, it hurt me, and you know I was delighted that the lads, um, you know, in the buckle, and these lads gave me the opportunity to take the to, to, the, the first team and. Um, and I often said is that listen, I try my best to get the team up and um, we did it and it's full credit to the players and the staff and you know everybody connected with the club. Well obviously you've still got a couple of games left, but um, assessment for the season. I think we've been absolutely brilliant and I think we're world champions. As I said, we've brought in a bit of experience this year. Um, we had a lot of uh, lads from the academy and uh, we, I, th- I thought we have been brilliant. Um, and um, yeah, just delighted, just delighted and enjoyed every every bit of this year. I'm saying this is probably an impossible question at this particular minute, yeah. but you are up now and you've been up there all season in the first division. Yeah. A lot of work to be done, but obviously looking forward to rejoining the Premier. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's where we want to be. Um, as I said, there was a lot of work done behind the scenes in the last two years, and um, since we're up, and that's because of all the work uh, the lads have done behind the scenes. You know, we're getting in the right players, and it is it is hard work. It's a tough division. You know, where you got Galway, you've got Waterford, you've got um, some big teams in the division. Um, so it's um, it's a massive achievement for us. But we got to go to work now again and get ready for next year because we know there's a big step up in the Premier Division. There's some serious teams and some very very good players up there. So um, yeah, back to work and we we get ready for next year. And obviously, there's been lots of ups and downs in uh, recent times at Cork. Mm. How do you feel the standing of the club is uh, as of this moment? It's in very, very good hands. It is absolutely, and it's, get, it's going from strength to strength. You see, there tonight we've over, over six thousand fans at um, at a game in the first division, and at this, when we played Galway this year, we had six and a half. So, there's a, it's, it, this is a massive club. It's in, I've been very, been very lucky to play here, um, coach here in the academy, and to, to manage the first team. Um, it's in, this is a massive club, and you know, if I can do anything to, to make this club better, and you know, with the staff and the players I have, we, we certainly will. But. This is um this is a special place. This is all right. That is Colin Healy, Cork City manager. Uh, before we kind of talk about the potential of the club and next season, uh, Paul. First off, just uh, the job he's done this year. Um, you know, especially last season was such a difficult one for them. But this season, they've been top pretty much largely the whole way through. Galway were running them close for for a long period. Uh, but by the end, they've just given themselves enough of a gap to uh. To, uh, to get promoted with games to spare. So just sum up the job he's done there. Yeah, I mean, they've been consistently good throughout the year after the fact that they've led from the front is, is not easy and it's a difficult thing to do. They've only lost three games and uh, what Colin has done there is built something with a number of young players. And I guess when you, when you bring young players in the cohort of players from the academy into the first team, what you might suspect is that consistency is actually a bit of an issue. The fact that he has them so well set up and drilled 
uh, is a testament to the job that he's done. And I think it's vitally important that we get Cork back into the league and have that kind of southwest um involvement within the division. And we all know the crowds that they that they've brought in with the, at the first division that they've brought in over the last number of years. And he seems to have regalvanized that team and that area off the back of what must have been a, a very difficult relegation for, for them to stomach, given where they had been over the last kind of number of years. So it's it's a superb job that he has done, given the fact um, that he has brought a number of those younger players through and he's maybe done it on a lesser budget that w- would have been available to that club over the last number of seasons. So I think it's great to have Cork back. I think the fact that Colin is there is he's another um figure that people will be familiar with it's it's great publicity for Cork and he seems like he's got a really good football IQ that can kind of help rebuild Cork and and hopefully get them back to a more sort of secure presence within the Premier Division and I'm sure listen there'll be a number of players who want to go down and play there there'll be a number of players who want to go play for Colin based on what it is he's done for some of the individuals down there and Fingers crossed they can they can be that positive influence that, that we've seen them be over the last number of years while playing in that Premier Division. Yeah, it's not that long ago, actually, when you think about it, that they were challenging at the at the very top level of the game here, um, you know, winning leagues, uh, you know, going in uh, going into cup finals, winning cup finals. Um, so Graham, just in terms of the the challenge they face now, because the step up to the Premier Division, obviously great achievement to get promoted um automatically, but the step up is going to be huge then and then trying to find that consistency and then all the stuff that's been mentioned there in terms of, you know, they've a great backing from the from the home support there, huge crowds. How do they how do they they grab all of that, pool it together and build a very strong foundations now, both on and off the pitch? You touched on it earlier. Obviously it's 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 the financial um help they can get to then help the recruitment, which which is we touched on how how important the recruitment is for the likes of Bohemians, but it's going to be equally as important for the team that's coming up in the likes of Cork and and do they have the budget to allow them to attract these players? Because like you said, it is such a um impressive place to go or attractive place to go as a footballer because and then what happens is, well, the crowd, I'd imagine the crowd will stay with them, but they won't win as many games as they did this season. So they're, they're going to they're gonna suffer defeats and they're going to suffer dif- dips in form. And that's when you see, well, will the crowd stay with them? I think they will in Cork. I think they've, they've, they, this is where they want to be in the Premier Division. This is where they feel they deserve to be as a, as a big football club. So then it's about them three things. They're going to suffer defeats because they are the newly promoted team. Um, they're gonna. It's gonna be up and down. The consistency might be a bit off because they have young players, which Paul touched on. But the crowd, the, the crowd has to stay with them and realize that that this isn't a core team that's gonna go uh, get promoted and automatically challenge for a title straight away. So they won't have as many victories at home as they did in the in the first division. But Collins, one of the one of the most genuine guys you meet in football. Um, and we, we would we would have played against Cork a lot during the two thousands when they were such a strong team, the likes of Joe Gamble, George O'Callaghan, Colin Healy, O'Flynn, uh, Roy O'Donovan, Kevin Doyle, they were a fantastic side and you knew like you'd be like, right, we're going to Cork and if you took Ant now at Cork, you were, you were so happy. Like, um, So I know how hostile it can be down there when you're playing and, and the shed behind them and it's a fantastic place to go and play football. The pitch is great, the crowd are on top of you, to get something out of Cork is always <laughs> means something. But it's a, they're a great addition and they're, they're one that should be always in the Premier Division. They're such a, a massive football club and, and they're so well supported down there because it's the other than Cope, it's the only really club that, that, that's down there and that, that can produce them levels of crowds that people turn out to watch. So they're a great addition and I'm delighted for the likes of Colin Healy and the likes of Liam Kearney who've done a great job uh, in, in rebuilding Cork after obviously the financial trouble they got into and the likes of John Caulfield leaving. So um, full credit to them and well-deserved this season. Yeah. Just on that one, Raph, as well, you know, guards are touching on that. Like, the, I, I don't get me wrong, I know there's other clubs down that area with Cove and that, but they've such a, yeah. a huge opportunity there with regards to the catchment area that they have with younger players. You know, if, if guards will be able to tell you within Dublin, you know, the competition you have to actually secure the best talent, they have a massive opportunity there to secure the best talent, work them through the academy, get them into the first team, and then look to sell on. I, I think Colin gets that. But if they can get that right, that's a, a major revenue source for, for a club like Cork City. And 
they're they're showing now that they're giving the opportunity to younger players if they can uh you know ensure that they have a really good setup on the academy side of things that that is a massive opportunity with the num- look at the national team the number of, of players that come from from that region it's huge and with brexit and everything and players not going as young for cork city that that should be you know priority number one two yeah. things on that as well paul if they can actually redo Bishopstown, Bishopstown's a fantastic pitch, but there's an opportunity for them to actually put an Astro in and build up a, an academy where they have a training pitch and an Astro pitch. And then it's really important that agents who are in that vicinity of that area leave the players in Cork and trust them that this is the best place for them. Instead of trying to take them out early, instead of trying to move them before they sign their pro deals to get them or I promise them they can get them into Italy or any of these players, you just need to be left alone. But Cork need to build up that in, in terms of Bishopstown because we were down there playing recently. Fantastic pitch. And, and you're thinking there's room here for an Astro. There's room here to really build a facility and the history around Bishopstown. It's a Champions League game played there against Galatasaray as well. So it's a fantastic opportunity to build on that historic um, presence that they have in that area. But then get them into pro deals, get them into the first team and just keep trust, get the agents from that area away from them and keep them at the club yeah um so cork city obviously promoted waterford as uh said there have been on a really good run um and probably left that run a little bit too late to actually challenge for automatic promotion but that momentum is carrying them into the fai cup semi-final and we've got both semi-finals on rt2 and rt player from 145 on sunday the Derry city treaty united game is first kicking off at two o'clock and then waterford shelburne at 445 all back to back so um you've got uh, plenty plenty on the tv for you there on the sunday for that but in paul in terms of the waterford shells game it seems to be the most evenly balanced when you take into account the talent waterford have the momentum and they're on and even notwithstanding Shelburne's status as a Premier Division club, but also Shelburne's own reasonably good form and how they've been building under Damien Duff. It, that's, that looks like it's going to be a cracking game. All you have to do is look at the teams at Waterford, not there on, on Roos. Uh, the fact that they beat Dundalk, they beat St. Pat's. They've really come good in, in recent weeks within the league. They they seem to have picked up a, a really good bit of form and with Phoenix Patterson banging form as well at the top end of the pitch, they're going to cause a lot of teams' problems. I think the fact that it's down in Waterford as well, Raf, is, is going to be very difficult. Not an easy place to go, I'm sure. The place will be absolutely packed with Waterford fans. Um, and it's not a game that Damien Duff will take lightly when, when you put that all together. Um, so it's going to be really, really even. I find it hard to kind of call with, which, with regards to which way it's going to go, purely on the basis of the fact that Waterford have come so strongly in the last number of weeks. Um, they'll have their own sort of promotion aspirations in mind but with this opportunity in the FAI Cup to, to win and then go to the Aviva and play in an FAI Cup final it doesn't come around too often so it's a really difficult one to really difficult one to call I actually tend to maybe lean in in Waterford's side I think just the, the momentum they have behind them and the teams that they've knocked out and, on route I think there'll be a huge sense of belief amongst the squad but one that you kind of flip a coin and you kind of take a guess which way it's going to go and Graham which way are you calling it um, I've, I haven't watched Shells up close yesterday and seen what the likes of um, Farrell can do and and, and Smith and Boyd um, I'd probably lean towards Shelbourne in terms of that Phoenix Patterson would be the one outstanding player from, from Waterford at the moment who's in such a rich vein of form He's free kicks. I think he's got three free, free kicks in a row and all of them are unbelievable. So that would be the one that if the but I just think Shells might have an, enough for them in, in the front areas. And like I said, in the three that I mentioned, Boyd has nine goals this season. Farrell's gone up to six goals this season. Um, and Smith has come in and, and, and really added to their uh, sort of attacking um, prowess. Um, I think Moylan has been a little bit of a miss for them in, in terms of driving from midfield. I'm not sure if he's going to come back into it. But I probably, having watched Shells yesterday run Shamrock Rovers close, I'd probably be leaning slightly towards Shells. But like you said, it's a home game in a semi-final of a cup. And that's that's the draw you want. And when you look at the teams they've beaten, as Paul mentioned, Warford are in a great vein of form. And they probably fancy themselves to get through into a final and also fancy themselves to get promotion to the Premier Division. 
Yeah, and Shelburne's captain was speaking to Luke Byrne uh, a couple of weeks ago at an EA Sports launch, and he's been kind of visualizing going all the way, obviously, with the recognition that it was going to, you know, they, they have to get past Waterford, that's going to be a tough game, and then whoever they get in the final. But here is just a short bit with him. Visualized it, yeah, uh, even before the, the quarter final, I visualized it, it helped motivate me uh, for Sunday. It would be, you know, the, the best day of my life, the biggest achievement of my life. Uh, couldn't imagine anything better, you know. So, like, of course, I'm going to dream about it, uh, and I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure it happens. And uh, as a team, that's all we have to do. Right, that is Luke Byrne, Shelburne captain, visualizing winning the cup, but obviously uh, with full recognition that they've got a tough road to go first before they can even go uh, think about that. And obviously, because on the other side of the draw, there is Derry City, and they're going to be heavy favourites, Paul, against uh, Treaty United. But Treaty themselves have had a really, really good run, and the pressure is all, is going to be all on Derry because all the expectations going to be on that side yeah Trady kind of a, a bit of a free hit here um, but it is very hard to see anything but a Derry win just when I know you go back to some of the bits and pieces we would have spoken about earlier on the, the form that Derry have at this moment of time just the amount of goals that they're scoring going forward and uh, the belief that they have within that squad so very hard to see anything but a Derry win if it was down in Trady maybe you might question whether or not it's going to be as straightforward as as some would suspect but the fact that it's in Derry home crowd players full of confidence it's very hard to see anything but a, a Derry win and you know throw in a, a really long trip for for Treaty up to Derry um you know very difficult to see anything but but a home win there yeah, and obviously Derry, um, also at that launch, I was speaking to Kieran Harkin, who unfortunately had a reoccurrence of his uh, ACL injury just, I think, about a week after I spoke to him. But he was talking there, sort of speaking from being around the club um, over the season since his injury at just how, you know, the, how they've been galvanised, but also how important silverware would be to them. And from a, just on a Treaty United point of view, though, um, Graham, you know, when you're that, when you're the the underdog in that situation, how do you go about it with all those cards stacked against you? I.e., going up, go long journey, venue, and then playing a great team like Derry. Um, I was probably in that position more when uh, playing in Scotland. We would have played against, would have played a semi final against like one one of the old firms, and you're going in hoping that like everything goes your way on the day, and um. Does it togetherness in your group that you you have to you have to have to try and go away and get results at these when you're when you're not when you are the underdog, you'll tend to, you know, yeah. As an it's just such a tough thing to do. But you're, you're hoping that you're hoping for a lot of things that you that you and your group as a team can play above, basically yourselves a little bit that you'd normally play, and you're hoping for just a little dip. And and then in in the performance of the team that you're playing against, because you know if that they turn up and they're on it, that the generally the quality is going to come through. And then you're hoping for a little bit of luck on the day, whether it whether it's um, luck with saves from your goalkeeper to play well or their goalkeeper to make a mistake. And then you're looking at refereeing decisions as well that you hopefully that that, that you get a little rub of the green and that. So all of them little things can add to generally an upset. And all the great upsets down the years have had sprinklings of that in of, of a team outperforming the other team a team not turning up who are favourites and being a little bit blasé about it and then a little bit of luck and then obviously some decisions going your way so if all of them can can land in favour of treaty then they might have a chance but I think what, what Paul touched on with Derry is that they seem to be in the ascendancy at the minute and they feel that and once you gather silverware when you are a team on the on the up it gives you that hunger for more. And even when you listen to Shamrock Rovers players talking about it now, or, or any players that have gone on, even going back to teams that were successful years ago, it'll always be like, oh, that first trophy we won gave us a taste for it. So it was the FAI Cup in 2019 that gave them a taste for it. Cork win an FAI Cup and then kick on again and win the league. And, the, and when players get a taste for success, it gives them a blueprint of well, how do you need to prepare for that? But it gives them that hunger to want to go and get that and taste it every season. And to be honest, I love the FAI Cup. I, I have a great affinity towards it because it's such a great day out. And and that the, the league is a slog, and the league can be for yourself. And that you, you, you there's a there's a great deal of satisfaction in it. But the atmosphere around an FAI Cup semi final and final. 
that just that oh, they're unbelievable and there's still a romantic side of that in this country more so than there is in the UK with with the FA with the FA Cup but they're, they're great days out for everybody involved for the club for their families and for the players in particular so I think I think all four teams will be trying their very best to make sure they get into a final and experience that yeah, speaking of the FA Cup, I think it's the Champions League that killed the FA Cup, at least partially anyway. But um, I think it was that, around about yeah. United in 2000, wasn't it, when they pulled out yeah, after they, they yeah, won the treble? Yeah, they and were then playing they, in that uh, World Club, yeah. Club kind of thing, yeah. And uh, yeah, but also just with the the fact, you know, getting top four and where it, yeah. used, to be, it used to be the Champions League, but now obviously you can finish third or fourth in the big league and get there. And yeah. that is the cue to plug, of course, that we have. Copenhagen versus Manchester City. So they're oh, an, under, well done, an, an underdog, an underdog against. <laughs> well done, <laughs> Raf. You're flying victims. on the plugs today. <laughs> that match is at 5.30 on Tuesday. It's before Ireland versus Scotland. So it's a kind of back to back. But um, there's not much to talk about in terms of City and Haaland. I think anything that can be said, I think, as I said last week, has been said about them. But at the top of the Premier League, obviously on Sunday, um, Arsenal beat Liverpool 3 2. Now, Jurgen Klopp wasn't happy with the penalty that. Uh, that led to uh, Saka scoring his second. But Graham, in terms of the what Arsenal have done there, because the one thing that was thrown against them was they hadn't really done it against one of the so-called big teams or bigger teams than them in recent years, and they have done that. So just in terms of the psychological gain they get from that, it's huge. Oh, it's massive. Yeah, and considering I think Liverpool went there last year and done a job on, on Arsenal, I think it might have been in the League Cup and the League a Jota had Jota, um, Jota had hurt them a little bit last. Um, I seen the incident for the penalty. I thought it was soft myself. I think, and I think they're the type of decisions that the referees have been sort of not given. You know, if the if there's a bit of pressure from the on the back or somebody, but it's not enough to to justify um, a foul. You know, it's, yeah, a small bit of contact, but it's not enough to justify a penalty. I think they're the ones that they've been trying not to give. So it was surprising to see that he gave it, but didn't even go over and have a look at it. It was more surprising. But in terms of the psychological side of it, considering, you know, the defeat open Old Trafford would have hurt them and they would have learned a lot from that. And and Arteta took a a lot of stick for for his substitutions and the timing of his substitutions. And you can see that he's probably learning from that and that would have, he probably would have had a discussions around it with his staff about when to make them. And yesterday, they go and see out the game when when it looked like Liverpool coming back to two all that they were in the ascendancy to then go and get a get the winner uh, with twelve minutes to go. It, it, it's great for the the belief we're in the squad and the belief in we're in the manager that the manager then gets from that squad then that they believe in what he's doing too and everybody has a buy in and that can carry them. Um, they've had a fantastic start of the season. I think they're still ahead of Man City, and they'll still be ahead of Man City when all the talk has been about Man City for the last two months. Uh, Arsenal have gone a little bit under the radar to a certain extent because of Man City and because of the Haaland factor. But Gabriel Jesus has been fantastic for him as well. But um, yeah, it makes uh, hopefully they can stay with it and actually ha- you can have a proper title challenge, which. Has made the league interest in this in the last few years in terms of Liverpool going at City, and you hope that Arsenal are able to continue that and really have a go off City and make it an intriguing league to watch. Yeah, and then of course Troy Parrott also got his first league goal for Preston. He had scored in the Carabao Cup earlier in the season, but he scored the winner against Norwich. A slightly fortunate finish, but as, as a striker, it doesn't injured matter. Then. Did he, Raf? He went off injured in the celebration. I heard. Yeah, he actually. Yeah, you're right. He was actually seemed to be limping afterwards, but. Uh, Look, however they go in, they go in, and I think <laughs> the way the way uh, what happened with him at MK Dons last season took him a while to get going, but once he did, it was uh, he went on a really good run then and finished last season quite well. So hopefully the same happens here. But finally, before we go, um, Paul, you were um, you were watching Chelsea and Wolves, and uh, there's a lot of focus on Joe Hodge. The Guardian afterwards were describing obviously Joe Hodge who plays for the Ireland under 21s now is involved in the playoffs again playoff against Israel. He looks like a player to whom Wolves as next manager should give more minutes in the coming weeks and months. So that's the Guardian view on it. So what was your view on how he performed and just the potential he seems to have? Yeah, he, he did really well. I mean, it's something you would have seen a lot of over the last number of years playing with, with the underage teams. Uh with the national side and somebody who you could see has 
a lot to his game. And I think he broke his leg at Man City last or at Derry City last year before he was due to go to Derry on loan and obviously released and ended up at Wolves. And I thought when he came on the other day, he did really, really well. Obviously, Ruben Neves is is out of injured at this moment in time. So it's actually presented an opportunity for him to come in, but he, he didn't do himself any, um, you know, disjustice. He, he held himself really well against a, a strong Chelsea midfield and he brought a bit of intensity and, and forward thinking to their play. So, um, you know, bodes well for him and for a young player to, to step into a game like that in Stamford Bridge when you're one nil down, not easy to get yourself on the ball, but he didn't shy away from it. Played alongside Joe Moutinho and did really well. Um, kept the ball, kept the ball moving, got themselves into some good positions uh, in the final third and offered a bit of a threat to, to the Chelsea team. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, the, the guys that they have in their uh, in temporary charge have been involved with the, the 18s and the 23. So maybe have had a bit more face time with them than uh, Bruno Large did in, in previous weeks and have seen enough to throw himself in there. So whether or not he plays over the coming weeks will be interesting, but he certainly didn't do his... His, um, his name or CV any wrong there on the weekend, but Wolves are a whole look, you know, like they're going to struggle off. Um, they've, they've certainly got the players there that they could turn it around, but there's a real lack of belief within that squad at this moment in time. And Chelsea rarely had to get out of second or third gear on the weekend. Yeah. And uh, just before we go, just a final plug of uh, all the different matches we have on RT2 and the RT player over the next week. So we've Ireland, Scotland uh, tomorrow night or on Tuesday night and obviously huge game for Vera Powell's side. We've the FAI Cup semis then on Sunday and then also before the Ireland, Scotland game, we have City and Copenhagen. So plenty of matches there to look forward to. And uh Thanks to Paul also and Graham for coming on and building up to all those games also for the review over the over the, the last week or so's action. So uh, lads, thanks a million for coming on this week. Brilliant, Raf. Yeah.